Hey everybody, welcome to our final lecture video of the semester. We're going to talk some more about muscles today. We're going to start by figuring out how we stimulate a skeletal muscle fiber and how we get it to contract. So hopefully you remember all the anatomy we went over last time because that is going to come into play today. So what we got here, what we are looking at, is a muscle fiber, a muscle cell right here. You can see it's many nuclei, you can see it's striations, it's myofibrils, where the contraction's gonna happen, the plasma membrane or sarcolemma. Now we also have a motor neuron right here. Motor neuron coming down, you see a Schwann cell giving it some myelination, you see it's telodendria, and we got an axon terminal right there. And that point where the axon terminal of the motor neuron meets the skeletal muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. And what we got to figure out is how an action potential going down this neuron prompts the release of neurotransmitters and then how those neurotransmitters get this muscle cell to contract. So that is what we're going to try and do. So we are zooming in on the neuromuscular junction here. So here is that motor neuron. An action potential will come down here. An action potential will make its way down here. And when it does, these vesicles right here are going to undergo exocytosis. And they're going to release these neurotransmitters that are in here. The neurotransmitters that are being released are acetylcholine. ACH there stands for acetylcholine. That is the neurotransmitter released by our somatic motor neuron onto our skeletal muscle cell. Now this part of the skeletal muscle cell right here, this part of the plasma membrane is known as the motor end plate. You met it in lab, so that should be familiar to you. It is going to be studded with receptors for acetylcholine. So what's going to happen is action potential comes down, releases, causes the release of the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then ends up in the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine then binds to one of these purple receptors here. This is an acetylcholine receptor. So we know acetylcholine receptors are known as cholinergic receptors because that means they work with acetylcholine. And we also know, we remember this from the autonomic nervous system lab, or lecture rather, that this type of receptor is called a nicotinic receptor because it responds to nicotine as well. Now upon the binding, upon the binding of acetylcholine to the nicotinic receptor right there, that receptor is going to open up. That receptor is an ion channel. And when it opens up, a little bit of potassium leaves and a whole bunch of sodium rushes in. And that rushing in of sodium is going to create a graded potential. And that graded potential is going to travel, 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 a little bit away from the motor end plate. And over here, adjacent to the motor end plate, look what we got. We got voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. We met these a while back when we were learning how action potentials are conducted. So the graded potential will prompt the opening of these guys. And what is going to happen is that we are going to get an action potential on our sarcolemma. And the action potential is going to move along the muscle cell. So, big takeaways here. Motor neuron releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes the skeletal muscle cell to create its own action potential. Then an action potential travels down the sarcolemma, the skeletal muscles plasma membrane. All right, so what we got to do now is figure out what happens next when an action potential goes along. 
that is one of our, we have a bunch of things to do. That is one of our many tasks. Okay, here we see that receptor again, okay? Um, I want to make this one quick point. After the acetylcholine binds to that receptor, so again, that same receptor, let me go back for a second, We're looking at that same receptor right here. After the acetylcholine binds to it, pretty quickly the acetylcholine gets broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And once that happens, that channel gets shut. So we have a way to get rid of the acetylcholine that was released. All right, so we're causing the muscle cell to do something, but once we cause it to do something, we're done. All right, we got to figure out what that something is. All right, we know the muscle cell has an action potential. I don't want to go through the stages of the action potential. I'm going to trust that you remember those from previous lectures. I'm not going to test you on this graph either, okay? So don't sweat that. All right. The action potential that we generated is going to be traveling along the sarcolemma. And what's really important to note is that, remember that the muscle cell had these passageways through it? They were called transverse tubules or T-tubules. And the action potential actually goes down the T-tubule. Because that's where the membrane is. Action potentials go along the membrane. That's where it is. And what's key to note is that the T-tubule is sandwiched by these two enlarged portions of that sarcoplasmic reticulum. Each of these enlarged portions right here is known as a terminal cisterna. And do you remember what they do? Do you remember what gets stored in here? It's calcium. If you said calcium, you are absolutely right. So the action potential is going to come down here. Now, the action potential gets adjacent to this part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum where we're storing calcium. So what do you think is going to happen to the calcium? Is it going to stay stored when that action potential travels down here? No. The calcium is going to leave the SR and get into the cytoplasm itself. So acetylcholine causes the skeletal muscle cell to generate action potential. The action potential travels, goes down the T-tubule, and then prompts the neighboring sarcoplasmic reticulum to release its calcium. Question now is what is that calcium going to do? All right, so we actually see the release here. So we see all these, this picture is trying to depict all those events. This purplish line is representing the action potential. It's going, 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 going. It goes down the T-tubule. It interacts with proteins in there, which cause the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the calcium ends up in the cytoplasm here. And that's when the calcium can then interact with the proteins of contraction. Do you remember what those two proteins of contraction are? If I give you their initials, they are actin and myosin. So the calcium is somehow going to interact with these proteins and get these proteins to cause the muscle cell to contract. Okay, let's figure out what's going on. And to figure that out, we got to look at actin and myosin. This is the myosin thick filament here. All right, this is an individual myosin molecule. To me, it looks like two golf clubs that have had their shafts kind of like twisted together. And there's the tail right there. It's got a bendy part, and it's got the heads. The heads have two important parts. They have a part that binds to ATP, so they can break down ATP and use its energy for contraction. They also have a part that binds to the other contractile protein, which is, remember, it's called actin. So these guys are actin binding sites. All right. Now, let's look at the thin filament up here, which is made of individual molecules of actin. Actin looks kind of different. It's kind of, kind of globular, kind of spherical. And actin has these sites for myosin to grab onto. If the myosin head right here 
grabs on to the actin, a little divot right there, then what's going to happen is the bendy region is going to pull and the muscle is going to end up contracting. However, notice that there's another protein in our story here. This ribbon-like brownish protein here is called tropomyosin. Tropomyosin covers up the binding site for myosin. So as long as tropomyosin is sitting on top of actin, myosin can't grab onto it and the muscle can't contract. All right, let's backtrack for a second here, okay? We know the neuron really acetylcholine. We know the acetylcholine caused the muscle cell to have an action potential. We know the action potential caused the muscle cell to release calcium into its interior. And now we got to figure out how that calcium allows myosin and actin to interact so that the muscle cell contracts. And the key is somehow we got to move this ribbon-like protein called tropomyosin because it's covering up the spots where actin gets grabbed onto by myosin. Now, there is a regulatory protein involved here as well. It's the yellow guys. It's called troponin. And troponin is actually going to interact with calcium. And when troponin interacts with calcium, it moves the blockage here. Myosin's able to grab onto actin and cause the muscle cell to contract. So we see it going on here. Here's our myosin. There's the heads that want to grab onto the actin, but they can't right now because tropomyosin is blocking actin. But look, here's the calcium. The calcium is present because it was released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It was released from it because an action potential went down the T-tubule. And the muscle cell had an action potential because it got stimulated by acetylcholine. Now, when calcium binds to troponin, troponin shifts. When troponin shifts, look how the ribbon-like tro tropomyosin has moved. And now all the binding sites on actin are exposed. Myosin grabs it. And using the energy from ATP, myosin then bends and pulls. And that's going to cause these guys to overlap more. These two guys right here, they're going to overlap more, and the muscle cell is going to shorten. And that's contraction. So, neuron releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine causes the muscle cell to have an action potential. Action potential goes down the T-tubule. Action potential in the T-tubule causes release of calcium. Calcium binds to troponin. Troponin moves. Moving tropomyosin. Exposing actin. Myosin then grabs onto actin. Uses energy from ATP. Pulls on actin. The two fibers overlap. And we get contraction. Wow. That's a handful. I know. All right. We check it out right here. We start at over here at number one. We see myosin is able to grab onto actin. Why is it able to grab onto it? Because actin's exposed. It's exposed because tropomyosin has been moved. Tropomyosin has been moved because troponin has bound to calcium. Now, when myosin grabs on, the myosin's high energy state right now. It's in a high energy state because it already broke down the ATP. Look, we know ATP is adenosine triphosphate. We don't see that here. We see adenosine diphosphate as well as a single phosphate. Now, what happens is the myosin releases the phosphate and it pulls on that actin. That pulling is called the power stroke, and it is going to shorten 
the sarcomere and shorten the muscle cell. Myosin then releases the ADP. And the myosin is still grabbed on. It doesn't let go until a new ATP grabs onto it. Then it lets go. Then it breaks down that ATP and it gets into the high energy position again. And if actin's still available, it'll grab onto it again and do the whole thing over again, making the muscle cell get even shorter. So this process can repeat itself as long as actin is exposed and as long as we have ATP. All right, so that is how muscle contraction works on an intracellular basis. Um, one of your assignments that you'll click on in Blackboard is actually to put all these events in order. So one of your, your assignments, your lecture assignment, I think it's your only lecture assignment this week, is to put all of these things in order. So definitely do that. Take, you know, do, try and, as you're doing it, try and write all the steps down and see if you can't get them all correct. All right, if you get stuck, shoot me an email, come to my office hours, do one of those things. Okay, now, eventually, though, contraction's going to stop, okay? Remember how acetylcholine was broken down by acetylcholinesterase? If the muscle cell doesn't get stimulated again and again by more and more acetylcholine, eventually, the muscle contraction's going to stop. And when the muscle contraction's going to stop, the sarcoplasmic reticulum has a protein called a calcium ATPase, which uses ATP to move calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. When that happens, that means there's no more calcium grabbed onto troponin, and tropomyosin goes back to its original blocking state. That means there's no more cross bridges. By the way, a cross bridge is what we call it when myosin has grabbed onto actin. If there's no more cross bridges, then there's going to be no more pulling of these filaments. And what's going to happen then is the connective tissue that got stretched during contraction is going to recoil. Maybe gravity will help out as well, and the muscle is going to go back to its resting length. This is basically how the muscle relaxes. All right. We are killing it today. We are doing a lot of stuff. We are now going to move on to another topic. We're going to kind of step back from that m sort of microscopic, molecular, intracellular view that we had been doing. And we are going to concentrate on a couple other aspects of contraction. To do that, we had to find something called a motor unit. We got to figure out this thing called a motor unit. A motor unit is a single motor neuron. Like, check out this purple guy here. A single motor neuron and the muscle fibers it stimulates. Okay? So I actually see three motor units here. I got my purple motor unit with my purple motor neuron and it's purple muscle fibers. Then I have my blue one, blue motor unit, neuron and it's blue muscle fibers that's my blue motor unit then I got my red motor unit right here red motor neuron and it's muscle fibers each motor unit is an all or none thing so if I stimulate this purple neuron it'll release acetylcholine on these purple muscle cells and they'll all contract they'll all contract fully okay um, here's the thing what your muscles can do, your muscles can vary the number of motor units involved in a contraction. All right, so let's say you abduct your arm. Do you remember how to abduct your arm? So this is you. Boom, boom. Smiling. That's your legs, feet. Here's your arms at rest. They're down. When you abduct your arms, your arms will then be straight out like so. What muscle does that? It is the deltoid. 
So let's say you want to abduct your right arm, and there's nothing in it. Go ahead and do that. Take your right arm out. Go ahead and do it. Now pick up something. Do you have anything heavy nearby? Do you have like a book nearby? Pick it up. Do the same motion, but now holding the book. Which one will involve more motor units? Which one will involve more motor units? Will it be holding the book or not holding the book? Obviously, it will be holding the book. More motor units. So if you stimulate more motor units, that is going to be proportional to the tension you develop. More motor units, more tension. You can also switch off. Let's say you just held that book out there. You would switch off between different motor units. So as one motor unit got tired, another one would take its place. As that one got tired, another one would take its place. And then you keep cycling through until all of them are totally fatigued. So more motor units involved, more muscular tension. A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of its muscle fibers it synapses with. All right, fantastic. Here we see just some graphs of this. Um, as I stimulate my motor neuron more, sorry, my, my then I'm going to get more motor units excited. And as I, as I get more motor units excited, as I change color here, I get more tension. So as I'm just using a couple motor units, I get a little bit of tension. As I use more and more motor units, I get more and more tension until I get to a maximum amount of tension. All right, excellent. Motor units are also different in size. Remember, a motor unit is one neuron and many fibers. So a bigger motor unit would have a lot of muscle fibers. A smaller motor unit would have fewer. If you think about a muscle like the gluteus maximus, its motor units are big. So every motor neuron goes through a lot of muscle fibers. In these extraocular muscles, the motor units are smaller. So every motor neuron goes to fewer muscle fibers. And so what that does is when there are smaller motor units, it gives us more control over the movements. We can make tinier movements with our eyeball than we can with our glute max, which kind of should make sense. All right. Onward to another idea, something called the muscle twitch. If we stimulate a muscle cell, it's going to contract and it's going to relax. Before it contracts, so there's a period from when we stimulate it until it generates tension. That period is called the latent period. And that's where everything we were talking about molecular, molecularly is going to occur. So the generation of the action potential, the travel of the action potential, down a T-tubule, release of calcium, binding calcium to tropomyosin, I'm sorry, to troponin, movement of troponin and tropomyosin, exposure of actin, grabbing on of actin by myosin, pulling, repeat. All right, that's the latent period. Then we have a period of contraction where tension rises and then a period of relaxation, which is much longer, where tension falls. Okay, that is known as a muscle twitch. If I give my muscle cell a, sting, a single stimulus, I will get a single twitch. Stimulate, contract, relax. It's a bigger scale down here. That's why the latent period isn't quite as obvious. So single stimulus, single twitch, okay? If I start giving multiple stimuli, the muscle twitches start to add together. So here's my first stimulus, contraction, in my first twitch. Relaxation, in my first twitch. But we don't let it relax all the way. Boom, we stimulate it again. When we stimulate it again, more contraction. And this time we get even more tension. Relax, stimulate again, more tension. Relax, stimulate again, more tension, until we get to a maximum amount of tension. This is called wave summation. 
where the repeated stimulation of the muscle cell causes the increase in muscle tension. Just think about it as being like you're able to get more and more calcium into the inside of the cell. And with more and more calcium, you're able to generate more and more tension. That's not like the complete total story, but it is good enough. By the way, this is called incomplete tetanus, what we've got here. Tetanus is actually the word for max muscle contraction. Tetanus means maximum muscle contraction. It's incomplete because we allowed some relaxation in between contractions. Okay, if I stick my stimuli closer to, close enough together, I don't allow any relaxation in between, and I still get wave summation, but now I'm getting what's called fused or complete tetanus, where the tension just rises and rises and rises. We get to that max value, and at that max value, we stay for, us, for as long as we can. That's called fused or complete tetanus. Now, I know when you hear the word tetanus, you might think of like a tetanus shot and maybe the condition of tetanus. Um, there's this bacterium called Clostridium tetany, and it's going to make these, these toxins, which inhibits part of your nervous system that would normally stop your motor neurons from working, basically. So your motor neurons all of a sudden start working like crazy and your muscle cells start contracting like crazy. You can see the flaring of the platysma there. All sorts of muscle cells contracting here. Um, eventually it can cause um, someone to undergo respiratory arrest because they, they can't relax their, their breathing muscles and they can't breathe in again. Um, happens in animals. Can happen. It can be really bad if it happens in, in, in newborn babies and neonates. Oftentimes you get it if you get a puncture wound on like a rusty nail or rusty barbed wire. That's where you get it. So tetanus refers to complete muscle contraction. And that is the, the consequence of infection with the Clostridium tetany bacterium. That's why there is this connection here. All right. This is not going to be on your test here, okay? But I just wanted to bring it up, bring it out in case you were wondering. All right. Moving on to another, another topic. What we're going to talk about now is different types of muscle contraction in like a gross anatomical view. So the first kind of muscle contraction we're going to talk about is this one called an isotonic concentric contraction and it's what this guy is doing is he goes from position A to position B so his elbow here is extended and here his elbow is flexed so he's using his biceps brachii his brachioradialis his brachialis as well and in an isotonic contraction the amount of load that we're moving isn't going to change Right? It's the same dumbbell he's using the whole time. So when my muscle hanging from, hanging right here, I got three kilograms in the beginning, three kilograms at the end. So the amount of tension I'm going to need to generate is just enough to move those three kilograms. And that's all the tension I'm going to need to generate, enough to move the three kilograms. Now, concentric means the muscle is going to go from being long to getting shorter. Concentric means we're going, the ends are going towards the center. And that's what happens when a muscle set, when a muscle is going to shorten. So this is an isotonic concentric muscle contraction. If we look at a pair of graphs, describe it. If we look at the top graph here, Notice that the muscle generates tension, 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 until it generated just enough, remember the weight was three kilograms, just enough tension to move the weight, and that's where it stayed. So iso, same, tonic tension, okay? Now this graph down here shows the resting muscle length right here, okay? 
And then as the muscle contracts, the muscle ends up getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until it relaxes again. So this shows how it is concentric. The muscle length is decreasing and we generate tension until we get enough and then we stay at that point. All right, that's one kind of contraction. Another kind of contraction is an isotonic eccentric muscle contraction. This is the kind of contra contraction you would do when you're doing the negative part of an exercise. So for example, this guy is doing a bench press. As he lowers the weight, as he lowers the weight, he doesn't allow it to come crashing down. All right, he slowly controls the weight as he brings it down. And he's using his pectoralis major to do that. Okay, so when you lower the weight, you're actually doing a muscle contraction with the muscle that you work when you raise the weight back up. And it's isotonic contraction because the weight is not changing. It's eccentric because as he is lowering the weight here, his pec major is getting longer. His pec major is acting with like a braking action to make sure the weight comes down slowly. Think about very slowly going from a position where your elbow is bent to a position where your elbow is straight out. As you do that very slowly, you can feel your biceps muscle lengthening, right? But it's also, it, it's generating tension. If you poke at it, you'll feel it's got some firmness because it's generating tension. So eccentric means the muscle is getting longer. Isotonic means that the amount of tension is not changing. All right, that's number two. Number three, number three, last one, is an isometric muscle contraction. This is where the muscle is going to contract, but it doesn't change in length. All it does is it's going to pull on the connective tissue parts. Isometric, same length. So the muscle contracts, but it doesn't change in length. If I look here, the muscle generates tension, but it never gets enough tension to move the resistance. And because it never gets enough tension to move the resistance, it never moves the resistance, and the length stays the same. All right. We are done with the three types of contraction. Earlier, when we were talking about how muscle contraction occurs inside the cell. We talked about how myosin had to break down ATP to get into a high energy state to be able to bind to and remove, not remove, sorry, bind to and move actin, in other words, to contract. So what I want to talk about now is where that ATP, that energy supply comes from. And one way we make ATP inside our muscle cells is this thing called phosphate transfer. So for example, if I have an ADP, an adenosine diphosphate, and I have another ADP, I can use an enzyme called myokinase, rip a phosphate off this guy, add the phosphate to this guy. And that gives me adenosine triphosphate, which is one of my energy sources, which is the energy source for myosin. I also end up with AMP, adenosine monophosphate. So this is one way I can make ATP for my muscle cell to use. Another way, another example of phosphate transfer, also requires an ADP. And now I have this other protein, the nah, this other structure called creatine phosphate and a protein called creatine kinase that rips a phosphate off creatine phosphate, adding it to ADP, making ATP and creatine. 
So these are two ways I make ATP. By adding a phosphate to ADP. These are okay, but they're not going to be enough for a hardworking muscle cell. So there's got to be other ways we make ATP. And another way we make ATP is by breaking down the sugar glucose in a process you may have learned about in general biology called glycolysis. In order to break down the sugar glucose, you're going to need a couple things. You're going to need two ATP molecules as well as these two molecules called NAD+. When you break down glucose in glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, as do the reactions um, we were talking about earlier, when you break down glucose, you end up with these two molecules called pyruvate. That's what the glucose turns into. Plus, you end up with four molecules of ATP. Remember, we started with two. We end up with four. So we have a net of two ATPs here per glucose we break down. Plus, we end up with two molecules of something called NADH, which we can use to make more ATP later. All right, so another way we make ATP for our muscle cells, for our myosin, is via glycolysis, where we break down glucose. But again, we're not getting a ton of ATP here. So there's more. All right. Now, what happens next depends on whether or not we have oxygen. Okay. So we start out with glucose. Remember, we are going to also require... Um, we're also going to produce, there we go, 2 ATP when we break down that glucose. We also end up turning 2 NAD pluses into 2 NADHs, and we get 2 molecules of pyruvate. If there is no oxygen present, if we don't have oxygen, because our respiratory system and cardiovascular system hasn't really like caught up to the muscle's actions yet, hasn't start delivering enough oxygen yet, if there's no oxygen, we'll take those pyruvates and use them to form lactate, all right, lactic acid. Lactate is just lactic acid without hydrogen. And when we do this, we actually generate NAD+, which then lets us break down more glucose. The lactate eventually goes, it's going to be used by, maybe used by your heart muscle, for example. Lactate actually does not contribute to muscle soreness. It's kind of a bad rap there. All right, this is what happens if there's no oxygen. If there's no oxygen, we take the pyruvate we get from glucose, we turn it into lactate. That's it. If there is oxygen, then we are going to be in a good spot. Because if there is oxygen, we're going to be doing aerobic metabolism. The things I talked about beforehand were without oxygen, so they would be considered anaerobic. But now we're going to be doing some aerobic stuff. The aerobic stuff happens in your mitochondria. The pyruvate we make from glycolysis, written here as pyruvic acid, goes into the mitochondrion and goes into a series of chemical reactions called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. That Krebs cycle is going to end up turning that pyruvate into carbon dioxide, and it's going to make some more ATP. Plus, it makes more NADHs and these other molecules called FADH2. Within the mitochondria, those guys do end up going into something called the electron transport chain, where we end up making even more ATP as well as water. And when we're doing this aerobically, we are now making 30-something ATP. Depends on how we're doing a few things. We usually think about it like 32 ATP, basically, for each molecule of glucose. That's different than just, that's much better than the two we get when we're just doing glycolysis alone. So if we have oxygen, if we are doing aerobic metabolism, we make a lot more ATP. Also CO2, water, and heat.
All right, those are our energy supplies. Now, the flip side of energy is tiredness, right? Fatigue. Well, what can cause muscle fatigue? It can be all sorts of things, okay? We can run out of stuff like acetylcholine. My motor neuron runs out of acetylcholine. I can't stimulate my muscle. We can have imbalances in the amount of ions. We can run out of glucose or the storage form of glucose, which is glycogen. We could run out of available calcium. We could generate too many hydrogen ions, too much ammonium, too many phosphates. These are all possible sources of muscle fatigue in and, in and around the muscle itself. Now, when we're talking about fatigue in the muscle itself, that is an example of peripheral fatigue. You normally don't get to peripheral fatigue. Normally, when you feel like your muscles are getting tired, you are experiencing central fatigue. Your brain and spinal cord are acting as what's called the central governor here, where they are going to give you the perception of tiredness to prevent you from injuring yourself. So your fatigue can be in your brain and your spinal cord. It can also be in the muscle cells themselves as well as the motor neurons. When you get to this part point of muscle fatigue, you're basically done. All right. If the fatigue is in your central nervous system, it is a little bit more malleable. Think about it. Would you perform better if people were cheering for you? Yeah, you would. And that's your ability to deal with some and overcome some central fatigue. If you were racing against your, your arch enemy, you could overcome some central fatigue. Now, fatigue gets a lot more complicated than these two slides. But I do want you to know that there are these two types, peripheral and central. And we just had, in the previous slide, we went over some of the causes of peripheral fatigue. Central fatigue, the causes can be a lot more varied. I mean, things like, I mean, overall, it's your brain spinal cord trying to stop you from getting hurt. But all sorts of things can affect it. Your, you know, how much sleep did you get last night? What's your stress levels right now? You know, what, what, what else is going on? There's all sorts of things that can impact your central fatigue. Okay, this is fantastic. When we're done exercising, we're often breathing hard, depending on how fit we are, right, for a long period of time. This is because we are in oxygen debt. We got to repay and restore all the things we used up. We need to get ions back in the right place. Like get calcium back in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Get sodium and potassium back in the outside and inside of the cell, respectively. We got to get our myoglobin stocked with oxygen again. We got to make new ATP. You know, we got to restock our ATP. We got to restock our glycogen. And we're going to be use, utilizing oxygen at a great rate, consuming oxygen at a great rate after exercise until we've taken care of all this restoration. And that is called oxygen debt. Okay. Awesome. Let's keep going. There are two major types of muscle fibers we're going to discuss. There are muscle fibers known as red ones, and there are ones known as white ones. If you think about ducks and chickens, or even just a chicken by itself, a duck pectoralis major, so a duck breast meat, is made of red muscle fibers. Chicken breast is made of white muscle fibers. Chicken thighs, made of red. And these two different fiber types are actually different in the amount of power they can produce and the amount of endurance they have. 
Like, who's better at flying? The duck or the chicken? Who's the better flyer? Chicken or duck? It is the duck. The duck is going to have better endurance. Red muscle fibers are going to be more for endurance. White muscle fibers are more for bursts of power. And we're going to expand on this as well. Let's talk more about this. Oh, let's look at some of them here, okay? We got white muscle fiber down here, red up here, darker. Red muscle fiber up here, white muscle fiber down here. The red muscle fiber is going to have more myoglobin and more mitochondria. That's why it has greater endurance. That's why it's got greater endurance, right? With more myoglobin, you can store more oxygen. With more mitochondria and more oxygen, you can do more rogue metabolism, keep generating that ATP, and persist in your contraction for a longer period of time. Okay, let's give another name for them. The red muscle fibers are also sometimes known as slow twitch muscle fibers. The white ones, the power ones, are known as fast twitch. So endurance, red, slow twitch. Power, white, fast twitch. Okay? Now, you personally, I don't know you, I don't know what kind of fibers predominate in your muscles. I don't know. I personally am more of, whoops, I personally am more of a red twitch person. I, or slow twitch, red muscle fiber person. I am more of a distance runner and less of a sprinter. So are you a sprinter? If you're a sprinter, are you a, are you a long jumper? Then you are going to have predominantly these white muscle fiber types. If you are more like me, you are more of a distance person, more of an endurance athlete, then you are going to have more red muscle fibers. Now, what you've got depends on two things, your mom and your dad. It is your genetics that is going to determine what your proportions are. Okay? Um, you can't turn one into the other. You can get better. Like, if you're predominantly a white muscle fiber fast twitch person, you can, with training, get better at your endurance activities. So likewise, if you're a predominantly slow twitch person, you can get better at those power activities. But you're never going to switch types, okay? All right. Speaking of getting better, though, if you are training, if you're doing endurance training, let's say you are training to do um, the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which is a 135-mile race where you run from the lowest point in the contiguous United States up to the top of Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the contiguous states, 135 miles, and you go from the lowest point to the highest point. If you were training for that, your muscles, cells would change, all right? You would increase your capillary density in your muscle cells. The more training you do, the more endurance training you do, you increase your blood vessel density so you can deliver more oxygen, more nutrients, take away more waste, more heat, more CO2. You're going to generate more my, and have more myoglobin, more oxygen storage proteins in your muscle cells. You're going to store more glucose in the form of glycogen. You're going to train your muscle cells to be better at breaking down fat for ATP. You're going to increase the density of mitochondria in your muscle cells. More mitochondria means I can do more aerobic metabolism, meaning I can make more ATP. You're going to increase your levels of ATP and creatine phosphate. You're also going to increase the levels of lactate you can tolerate in your bloodstream. And these are all things which will give you greater endurance. Odds are you're never going to be as fast as these two guys are because they're just incredible. But these things will happen in your muscle cells and these are all good things. 
But of course, you don't just want to train your muscles for endurance. You want to be a well-rounded athlete, well-rounded person. You want to do some strength training too, some resistance training. Whether that's lifting weights, like she's demonstrating right there. You've got the barbell in a nice front rack position. But when you are moving heavy things, whether that's you know body weight exercises, whether that's moving barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, whatever you got, your muscle cells are going to change. Your muscle cells are going to grow bigger. Fiber hypertrophy. Muscle cells get bigger. You are going to have more ATP and more creatine phosphate. You are going to have more enzymes for glycolysis because most of your strength training type movements are going to be quick, right? They're not going to be of enough duration for you to be doing things aerobically. It's going to be anaerobically primarily. You're going to have more myofibrils in your muscle cells too. If your muscle cells are getting bigger, you can have more myofibrils. More myofibrils means more actin, more myosin, more pulling, more contraction, meaning you are going to generate more power. All right, so go out and do these things. Lift some weights, go running, go walking, whatever you like to do. Okay, with that, folks, we are done amazing we are fantastically finished y'all have been doing an awesome job this semester in this online class wish i was teaching you guys in person this is definitely far less preferable for me i don't know how you feel but i like the in-person stuff better with that i will wish you a fond farewell and good luck on your final exams take care bye bye